I grew up in suburban Philadelphia, the Valley Forge area, Stratford Wayne, Valley Forge area. Uh, went to, I was very fortunate. Uh, my father was a big believer in education, and uh, he always said if, you know, if it was a choice between sending his kids to school and, 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 and eating, he'd send his kid to school. So I was very lucky. I got to go to private school. Um, and I went to the Hill School in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, which is a very high end, uh, uh, at that time, boys preparatory school. It's now co ed. Um, and then I went to college. I went to Harvard. Uh, graduated from Harvard in 1976. Graduated from Hill School in 72, Harvard in 76. And I was really, like most college students, you know, wondering what I was going to be when I grow up. You know, what am I going to do in my life? And I was very interested in government work. I was very interested in uh, international relations. So I applied, you know, I applied for the CIA. I applied for DIA. I applied to the Foreign Service, took the Foreign Service test applied to grad school in international affairs and my interest in I'd always been interested in the Navy <clears throat> excuse me because of my dad and also because as a kid I was you know I was into airplanes and ships like a lot of young young boys and girls but uh, and I remember something that was very influential for me was we got National Geographic and I can't remember what year it was but I was just a little boy when they published a National Geographic and on the front cover was the nuclear Navy sails around the world and it was Enterprise, I want to say Long Beach and Truxton, nuclear-powered surface ships that were sailing around the world. And that, was, that really captivated me. So, so while I was in college, I thought, well, the Navy has this Air Intelligence Officer program where they train you to be an intelligence uh, analyst and an officer, and um, uh, that'll be fun, join the Navy, see the world, you know, earn a little bit of money. Be, you know, as an officer, I would have a pretty good quality of life. And... Um, so I thought that's what I'd do. So I went to see the recruiter. The recruiter was himself a pilot, and he, he noted that I had perfect eyesight. I had 20-20 vision. And he said, you know, why don't you want to be a pilot? And, and, and my response was, well, I'd love to be a pilot, but I don't want to be in the Navy for six years. That's too long. And he said, okay, fair enough. I'm going flying this weekend. You want to come with me? And so that was the hook, you know. Um, back then, the Navy recruiters had had small training airplanes and they could take prospective candidates up in the airplane and it was also an evaluation to see how aeronautical adaptable you were because if you're just sitting there puking your guts out the whole time you probably shouldn't be a pilot you know probably I mean you might be able to get over it but but anyway I loved it I loved flying I thought that was really cool and uh, I got interested in that program so I went off and I did after I graduated from college, I, I did the Officer and a Gentleman program, uh, which the Navy called Aviation Officer Candidate School down in Pensacola, Florida. If you saw the movie Officer and a Gentleman, okay, it's on Netflix. Educate yourself. Watch that movie. Um, and uh, it's about, it was written by a guy who had graduated from that program. And it's a, it's a drama. It's a love story. But it's set in uh, Aviation Officer Candidate School. And I went through that. I got commissioned an ensign in the Navy, went off to flight school, uh, learned to fly, uh, did well enough to get selected for jets, which was my first choice. Basically, you, you rack and stack your choices, you know. My first choice was, was jets, second choice helicopters, third choice maritime patrol airplanes. And depending on your grades and the needs of the Navy, of course, um, you may get one of your top choices. I was lucky I got jets went through jet flight training in Kingsville, Texas, uh, carrier qualified in the basic jet trainer, and then they went through the advanced training, carrier qualified in that. And when you carry a qualify in the advanced trainer, that's when you get your Navy wings of gold. I uh, became a naval aviator, and I was ready for assignment to the fleet. Uh, I got sent to the, uh, the A-7 Corsair training squadron, which was in Lemoore, California. Central Valley of California, near Fre south of Fresno, and uh, learned to fly that airplane, carrier qualified in that airplane, and my first fleet assignment was uh, in Japan. So, you know, three, within three years from graduating from college, I was flying single-seat tactical jet airplanes off of aircraft carriers uh, in Asia, which was pretty cool. And, you know, I was throwing every other paycheck in the drawer because I, had, I was living in the Navy. I had nothing to spend my money on. And uh, a lot of great adventures doing that. Uh, did well, decided I want to stick around. A lot of guys were getting out and going to the airlines. 
airlines in those days were hiring. Um, had I done that, I'd probably be a retired airline captain now. But I decided I wanted to stay in, and so I, I did an instructor tour teaching others to fly the A-7. Uh, then I wanted to stay in the Navy because the F-18 was coming in. And I thought, oh, I want to be an F-18 pilot. And the price of that was I had to do what's called a disassociated sea tour, whereas you, where you go aboard an aircraft carrier, but you're in a non-flying status. So I was on Enterprise, the same ship that had inspired me when I was a kid, uh, but I was not flying off Enterprise. I was working on Enterprise. And, and that, that wasn't fun, but it was a job I had to do to get the follow-on, which was training in the F-18. So did that got qualified in the F-18, got carrier qualified in the F-18, became a, there was a little bit of a backlog, so I did a, about a year stint as an F-18 instructor pilot, teaching other people how to fly the F-18, till I finally went to my, my squadron as a department head, kind of middle management. I had several officers and other folks working for me, uh, as well as flying, and um, you know, at this point I'm thinking, I want to stick around, because now what I want is to be in command. I want to be the boss. Uh, and that required hanging around, so I uh, finished that tour, it was in that tour that I got married. I uh, met my wife and got married, and we, we uh, soon after getting married, we got sent to Washington, D.C. I went to work in the Pentagon, the five-sided wind tunnel. Um, not a nice place to work. Well, what was what working in the Pentagon like? Uh, we we could spend all day on that. Um, it's the biggest office building in the world. It's, bi it's a big office building, you know. And I went to work every day, and I was briefing admirals and generals, and doing what they told me to do. And it was and, staff work. And this this was in the Cold War. They thought. Like, yeah, this was post Desert the Desert Storm had just ended. I was involved in Desert Shield as a department head in my flying tour before that. So I'd flown a bunch of missions over Saudi and Iraq as part of Desert Shield. And then just before Desert Storm started, I actually rotated out of the squadron, just timing. And so I, I actually missed that combat portion of Desert Storm, and now I'm in the Pentagon. So it's post-Desert post Storm, I was in the Pentagon. So let's go back a little bit. So, sure. um, towards the Cold War, as a naval officer, what was that like? Well, it was very interesting. You know, we saw the, we saw the shift. You know, in my 33 years in the Navy, I saw the shift from sort of pro-defense, um, administrations to, let, let, let us say, administrations where defense wasn't such a high priority. So I was in the Navy during the Carter years, the Jimmy Carter years, when there wasn't as much emphasis on defense. A lot of that was bare bones, kind of budget resources, you know, ability to do things. Then Reagan comes in, wants to build up the military. All of a sudden we got more money than we can spend. You know, and I saw that, and that, 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 that up and down sine wave continued throughout my naval career. And it wasn't just limited to Republicans and Democrats, it was kind of what the mood of the nation was and the mood of the administration was on whether they are going to support military expenditures or not. Um, but, so that, that part was interesting, and of course watching the Soviet Union collapse was very interesting. A lot of people said at that time, Oh, well, that's the end of history, right? You know, we're all just going to live happily ever after because the big threat, the big boogeyman has gone away. And, of course, we found out when he fell that the big boogeyman was not 10 feet tall, that the Russians had huge problems, the Soviets then, I should say, had huge problems. Uh, and their military, while it looked impressive on paper and from a distance, um, uh, was a different animal. I I'm glad we never fought them because thousands of people would have perished. But... But they weren't the boogeyman we thought they were. Um, and a lot of people, like I said, they thought it was the end of history. In fact, a guy wrote a book about that. A guy named Francis Fukuyama, famous historian, wrote a book. It's the end of history. You know, we're all going to live happily ever after, and, and the whole world's going to be rich and healthy and happy. And, of course, history doesn't end simply because one boogeyman goes away. Um, and uh, then we started... Being, becoming more and more involved in the war on terror, the war against Islamic extremism, um, and you know, you, you're familiar with the rest from then on. So, so that's what it was like during the Cold War. A lot of relief that the Russians were gone, a lot of trepidation about what the future might hold, uh, a lot of discussion about what is the 
the dividend of, of winning the Cold War? Well, the dividend is peace. Um, but you got to remember how you got there. Uh, I think we a lot of people forgot how we got there. And this is typical. If you look at long-term trends in American history, this is very typical. In post-war periods, post-conflict periods, you know, they disable the defense apparatus because we're not going to have any more wars, right? And this is something I think we have to guard against. So shortly after it was the Gulf War, mm -hmm. where were you then? Well, in the Gulf, uh, well, I was in the Pentagon, and I was uh, hoping to be selected for command of an F-18 squadron, and my my hopes were realized. I was I was selected. I got selected to be. Um, to command a wonderful squadron, uh, Strike Fighter Squadron 146, the Blue Diamonds, again back in Lemoore. So after moving my wife from, and, and now my son from California to Washington, D.C., I moved them back to California, uh, where I became the squadron commander. And that was a wonderful squadron. We did great work. We were involved in uh, Southern Watch, flying combat missions over Iraq to uh, enforce the no-fly zones. Uh, did get shot at a lot by Iraqis there. Um, they never came close, but you know it's interesting to be shot at. As Winston Churchill said, the greatest thrill in life is to be shot at without result. Um, so we did that and came home. Um, I thought I was going to go to Navy War College. That's what I wanted to do. I, I decided at that point I wanted to stay in the Navy. I wanted to have another command. I really loved being in command. Um, we were very, very successful, that command, um, whether that's because I liked it or not, I don't know, but I suspect those two are related. Um, I thought I was going to Navy War College. My orders got changed at the last minute. I got sent instead to Quantico, Virginia to work for the Commandant of the Marine Corps on, the, on his staff. I worked for the Marines for two years and then finally uh, got allowed to go to, uh, got orders to go to the National War College in Washington, D.C., which was a wonderful break for me because it's a year of academics, it's a year of studying. It's studying uh, history, studying uh, warfare, studying uh, politics, international politics at, a, at the grand strategy level. And I wound up getting a master's degree there in national security studies. Um, and then it was off to Italy. So I moved my family again from Washington. We moved 17 times in 34 years. And they were not sent across the street moves. So we moved from Washington, D.C. to Naples, Italy, where I was on a NATO staff there. I was the operations officer of a NATO staff, so we were working with other nations. I had, a, you know, I had German officers, British, Greek, Turkish, Italian, Spanish, uh, working for me, uh, as well as many Americans. So that was interesting. I loved living in Naples, Italy. Love Italy, um, and uh, we were we we were involved in that work during the big dust up with with Serbia and Kosovo, which you may recall. You were. A child then. I, was, no, no, I, I wasn't even born yet, but I know. You weren't even born yet. Okay. You know what happened. I mean, you know, the Serbs got crazy there, and you the breakup of Yugoslavia, which was a, a terrible mess for Europe. Um, so we were involved in all of that. I spent some time in Albania and in and in Kosovo. Um, what was that like from well, from your point of view, um, with all these other foreign officers and American officers too, dealing with this conflict happening? Well, the the, the foreign officers were wonderful. They're they're just like us. You know, I have more in common with a German naval officer than I probably do with an American person walking down the street because he and I do the same thing. You know, we're, we have the same values and everything. And so working with our allies was wonderful. The French, wonderful allies. Um, and what was it like dealing with uh, with NATO and that conflict happening? Well, uh, you know, it's a bureaucracy. There's a lot. It's frustrating sometimes. Um, of course, when you're in a place like Albania, it's hard to believe, at that time, it was hard to believe that you were in Europe. That, you know, Italy's 80 miles across the Adriatic Sea over there, you know, this this modern, sophisticated, cultured place, and here we felt like we were in the Wild West. Now, that's gotten a lot better, and I'm not slamming the Albanians. It's where they were at that period of time. They're members of NATO now, and they're they're vastly improving their, their situation in Albania. Um, but at the time, it was the Wild West, and we didn't know there was a lot of uh, Islamic terrorism going on, and um, a lot of they, they were they were being sheltered in a lot of places like Afghanistan um, and Kosovo and Albania. Um, so we always were kind of looking over our shoulder, 
um, because there was a terrorism threat. So anyway, just backing up. So I, uh, I I graduated from War College. I did my 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 tour in in Italy, uh, and uh, I got selected. I thought I was going to get selected to be a Navy uh, Air Wing Carrier Air Wing Commander because I had all the tickets. I punched all the. I had I had served in all the jobs and done well in all the jobs that would require me that would be required for me to get to that level and I thought that was the next step and I was very disappointed when I wasn't selected uh, so my wife and I you know we we had another glass of wine on our porch in Italy and said well maybe it's time to start thinking about another career because I was getting old in the Navy I was getting senior in the Navy and and yet I had not achieved the next rung in the ladder um, so a year goes by and once again that selection board meets and this time I was selected but not for an air wing I was selected to command a ship which was a surprise to me but a pleasant surprise because I always thought in the back of my mind that I would enjoy that and I did um, I went and, and uh, I took command of USS Juno which was a name for the capital of Alaska which was an amphibious assault ship uh, based in Sasebo, Japan. So my wife and I moved to Japan with our young son. And uh, I was captain of that ship in Sasebo, Japan for two years. And I was on that ship when 9-11 happened. Um, there's a whole funny story about that if you have time later. But so, so, so that just puts it in time frame context for you. I was the captain of that ship. We did pretty well. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be selected again to command uh, another ship, uh, this time the aircraft carrier John F. Kennedy. So I uh, took command of Kennedy in 2002. The circumstances of that is a whole other interview. Um, but it was interesting. The, my predecessor was fired. And I wound up going to the Kennedy uh, 11 months early. Uh, and without the training I'm supposed to get in preparation for that job. Uh, so it was risky, uh, but I was captain of the Kennedy for uh, two years, took the ship into combat against Afghanistan, came back from that. Um, towards the end of my tour on Kennedy, I was selected for admiral. My first admiral job was in the Pentagon again, back in the Pentagon, working in the National Military Command Center uh, as the basically the general, the, the flag and general officer on duty in the, pe in the basement of the Pentagon. There's always 24-7, 365, there's a watch team on watch. That right as we speak, right now, there's a team on watch, and it's always led by a Navy Admiral or Army General or Air Force General. And their job is to brief the President in the event of a crisis and in the event of a nuclear war. So um, now I went, when you got to the, the, was it the JFK you were on? Mm-hmm, John F. Kennedy. What was that like? Well, you know... I felt like, I guess, uh, I was thinking about it, I've thought about it a lot, that I felt like Truman felt when Roosevelt died. You know, like, oh my gosh, now I'm the boss. Because now I was in command of this giant aircraft carrier. Oh, right, the guy got, okay, let's go. The guy in front of me got fired. So wh why did he get fired? What happened? Uh, that's another long story. We don't have, we don't have enough beer. Um, but basically, poor leadership. Um, at the end of the day, it was poor leadership. There were a lot of other things, but at the end of the day, it was poor leadership. So he gets fired. And I have to take over a broken ship, and I have to fix it, and I have to get the crew out of the doldrums, and get them excited about working again, and get bring in a lot of new people, revitalize the organization, change the culture of the organization, which was a very defeatist culture, uh, a very, uh, a, a very, you know, the, a ship takes on the, the personality of its captain. And this is true. If you, if you go like on a cruise ship now, if you go on a carnival cruise. The ship takes the the, the ship's crew takes on the character of the captain, and the things that the captain emphasizes, they will emphasize, and the things that the captain ignores, they will ignore. So, so if you're the captain, you got to be careful what you ignore. So, so as captain of the John F. Kennedy, we had to work very hard to make sure we were moving in the right direction to get the crew motivated and 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 happy with their job and satisfied with their job, and and then of course the job was to launch and land airplanes which we were very good at, um, and we got better. And we went into uh, the Arabian Gulf, we launched strikes into Afghanistan, um, and it was a real turnaround because we, we made the ship operational and 
that's probably why I wound up getting promoted out of that job is because we did really well. We went from, you know, the worst to first. Um, just like, in, you know, in, you know, on a football team when they've been losers and they get a new coach and then suddenly they're winners. So that whole turnaround process uh, was very interesting, very complicated. I had a lot of help. I had great help. I had a wonderful executive officer. I had a wonderful command master chief. Uh, who's your senior enlisted person and uh, the three of us were a team and and we worked very well together we're still good friends today um they were wonderful men i had i had 1200 women in my crew so that was a new challenge i had not commanded women in large numbers before um this was in a period when the navy was integrating women into the into the operational structure um after years of paying lip service to it they were finally doing it and so there's, there were challenges with that. It wasn't all rainbow, rainbows and unicorns. There was a lot of problems with it. You know, there was problems of sexual misconduct. There was troubles of fraternization. Um, there, were, there was prejudice against women. Uh, there was prejudice by women. Um, uh, women who would use their femininity uh, as a tool. Uh, if they didn't like a guy, they just said that, you know, he touched her inappropriately. Now he has to defend himself because if she said it, it must be true, right? So we had that that we had to deal with. And, and also legitimate discrimination against women uh, in a lot of ways. Um, pregnancy was a problem. You can't be pregnant on a Navy ship. The reason is it's a fetotoxic environment. It's, not, it's dangerous for the baby. So as soon as I found out a, a female sailor was pregnant, I had to get her off the ship. And I had to find a replacement, because now someone's not doing the job, right? And that's what I, as the captain, that's what I really care about at the end of the day, is that the job gets done. Now, I want to take care of the crew while I do that, otherwise the job won't continue to get done. But that was, that was what, that, those were among the many challenges that we had. Uh, ultimately, it was successful, not without issues, though. What are some of the places you went on that um, JFK? Oh, gosh. Well... I had been normally a Pacific Coast sailor, a Western Pacific type thing, um, operating out of California and points west. For the Kennedy, we were stationed in, uh, in uh, Mayport, Florida. So I, and we deployed to the Mediterranean. So the first thing we did was head across the Atlantic. Some people were quite certain we were going to sink and not make it across the Atlantic. Uh, through the Straits of Gibraltar, into the Mediterranean, our first port visit was uh, Suda Bay Crete, basically to take on supplies. We got, I think, two days of relaxation. Uh, uh, of course, the Greeks are great allies. They're part of NATO, uh, so that was very that was fine. And then into the Suez Canal, through the Suez, into the Red Sea, uh, North Arabian Sea. We made two port calls in Bahrain, two port calls in the United Arab Emirates, uh, Dubai. Um, those were just, because of the security concerns, those weren't a lot of fun. Um, in Dubai, we were pretty much confined to the pier. Um, but did, did the Kennedy actually have to go on any strike missions against uh, terrorists? In absolutely. Asia? We launched uh, first, first uh, our first night strikes in Afghanistan were March 2nd, uh, 2002. Um, we were not the first carrier there for the, the, the war against Afghanistan, but we relieved a carrier that was there previous to us. The uh, I want to say it's the George Washington, but I might be wrong on that. I think it was the George Washington we relieved. Anyway, um, it was their turn to go home, so we took over and we launched our strikes that night. Uh, and then we operated for about four months against the Taliban and hitting targets in Afghanistan. One of the problems was we ran out of targets. There's nothing to destroy anymore. Um, and so the mission transitions to one of being on-call uh, support for troops. So basically if troops get into, into contact, they'll call for help. So what that means is you have to orbit. And, and think of the distances involved. If you're launching carrier strikes against Afghanistan, it's kind of like being in the Gulf of Mexico and operating against Chicago. And so to maintain aircraft on station at those distances was a huge technological challenge and operational challenge, and we did that. Um, yeah, how was that? Let's say, like, when you, let's say they need air support, and you're like, 
two hundred miles away or something. By the time they get yeah. there, they could just be gone. What's well, called the tyranny of time and distance. You know, the time and distance is going to trump everything. So, so you got to be there, and you got to be there with the right equipment and the right stuff, and be ready to rock and roll. Um, and our guys were for the most guys and gals. We had females flying those missions too. So our guys and gals were doing that, and they were doing a great job. Um, we didn't lose any airplanes or anything like that. Um, we were very fortunate. Um, but long missions, you know, six, seven hours in the cockpit. And it's not sitting on a nice, comfortable seat like this. It's sitting on a hard ejection seat. You're mostly on that? Or did you, did you go flying with them sometimes? I didn't get to go flying with them. Had I gone through the normal training track that I was supposed to go through, I would have gotten requalified in the F-18, and I could have flown F-18 missions in the daytime. Now, I probably wouldn't have gone into Afghanistan, and this is going to sound conceited, and I don't mean it this way. I was too valuable to set, be sent over Afghanistan where I might get shot down. But I could, say, maybe protect the carrier or stuff like that. But And it didn't matter because I wasn't, I never got that, I never had the opportunity to do that. So I was unfortunate in that I did not get to fly from the ship I commanded. Nowadays, that's pretty rare. Most of the captains of our aircraft carriers now don't get the opportunity much to fly from the ships they command. In the old days, that was kind of routine, but not anymore. By the way, we have a female now. Uh, Amy Bauernschmidt is the captain of Abraham Lincoln. So we have, we have, and heck, the chief of naval operations is a woman. Just confirmed a few months ago. So, so yeah, that, that process has run its full course, and now it's just normal. So after the JFK, you went to the Pentagon again? Uh, yeah. Um, I was, as I said, I was a watch officer in the bowels of the Pentagon, watching the big screens, like Captain Kirk, you know, sitting on the bridge and looking at the big screens. That's kind of what I did. And uh, You're an admiral at this point? Now? I was an admiral. There's always one, a, a one-star officer, admiral or general, on duty 24-7. And he's the guy, or she, is the person who is going to call the... Um, the chairman. In those days, it was uh, it was uh, Dick General General Myers, Air Force General, and then I worked for uh, Marine General Peter Pace. Uh, your job is to call, wake him up in the middle of the night and tell him something bad's happened, and then the next call might be to the president. So that's the that's that's the level of that job. And I did that for a couple years, and uh, I wasn't. My, my career was kind of petering out. It looked like I wasn't going to do much more. And I was trying to figure out what do I do for my last year in the Navy. But I was very fortunate. I got, I, I saw an opportunity and I applied for it and was selected to be the defense attache in the United Kingdom. So I went, I was basically the senior military officer in uniform in Great Britain, uh, which was great for my family because we lived in London. My son went to the American School of London, which is like a, a private school uh, in London, uh, you know, run on the American system, American accredited. It's like going to an American private school, except it's in London. So that was a great deal for my son, and my wife loved living in London, and I didn't own a car. I walked to work. It was great. And what's being an attache like? Attache? Um, we met people from all over the world. London is the largest attaché community in the in the world. There's 208 attachés from like 110 countries. So, um, and and your job is to establish is to maintain relations, personal relations with those people, and also senior British officers. So I got to know personally all the three and four star generals and admirals in the British military. They're great allies, of course. They're fantastic allies. Um, so I got to know. I, I mean, I was in their house you know, drinking their whiskey. Uh, you know, uh, also established relations with the other attaches that are there from other countries. So we made great friends with, you know, the Finns, you know, the Turks, the Italians, the French. You know, I even had the Chinese guy in my house drinking my beer and probably planting bugs under my table. Uh, you know, all the different countries and and that's actually paid off in retirement because when my wife and I travel we, we've, we've looked up some of these people like we were in Peru and I called up the 
guy I knew in London who was Peruvian, and he goes, oh, we'll come pick you up, you know, and of course they take us out to dinner, and it's a, it's a great reunion, it's a wonderful time. And we have friends from Finland come visit us, and friends from Australia come visit us. So it was a wonderful job and of meeting military officers from all over the world and their families, and knowing them at a personal level and, and uh, a social level, you know. Uh, so that was great. And around what year would this have been? It was 2007 to 2010, and in 2010, I wasn't going to get promoted again. Uh, basically, I'd reached mandatory retirement. Um, it was looking like I was going to have to retire before my son graduated from high school, so I was trying to figure out how to get my son through that school, and I eventually decided I'd, I'd just pay for it because that school was so important to him. But the Navy was very kind to me, actually. They said, no, we'll, we'll let you. The Secretary of the Navy said, you can stay on active duty for one year past mandatory retirement so that your son can finish school. Now, it wasn't entirely for me. They didn't have a replacement for me. So it was also beneficial for the Navy to leave me there. Uh, but that, because normally, if you're a one-star admiral, uh, you have to retire at 33 years. And I was at the 33 mark. Uh, but they let me serve 34. It's an up or out system. You get promoted or you leave. That's how the pyramid gets smaller. Going back to the second time which at the Pentagon, mm -hmm. um, did you ever have, was there any crises like you mentioned, uh, maybe they get the president or any um, upper uh, class general? Um, a general? lot of minor crises. Cri t that at the time were crises. Nothing of staying power, nothing of huge importance. You know, an unexpected missile launch from Russia, for example. Like, for example, the Russians would be testing a new rocket. And, of course, they're not going to tell us. And they'd shoot it. And we would detect that. So, you know, everybody goes crazy. Is this a nuclear attack? Of course, it's not. But, but you have to be prepared for that. And so that, th those were a few moments of terror. Um, you know, if the Chinese or the Russians would launch a rocket that we didn't know about in advance, or the North Koreans, if we didn't know about it in advance. And a lot of times we did know it was coming either because they told us or because we detected it through intelligence methods. In which case, then it wasn't a crisis because we knew they were about to do it and we watched it happen. So what was it like getting out of the Navy? Well, it was sad in a lot of ways because you miss the people. It was liberating in a lot of ways because you know, no, longer are you, no longer are you subject to the whims of the U.S. Navy on where you're going to live and what you're going to do. Um, suddenly I could do whatever I wanted, which Sounds great, but can also be scary. And I did struggle with it a little bit for a couple of years, wondering, you know, what do I want to do now that I've grown up? You know, what do I want to do when I, while I'm getting old? So I, I struggled with that for a few years, but um, it worked out, and I, you know, supported my family and all that. Um, finally decided to get out of Northern Virginia and come down to North Carolina, where life is a little slower, taxes are lower, People are nicer, traffic's less, you get the idea.